Namaste, my dear brothers and sisters. The love and blessings of the mother and Sri to all of you from Sri Ashram, Delhi branch. With that, we turn to today's session, which is the last session in uh, the S.03 course. It's the last session, but that doesn't mean that our relationship will end. Uh, the relationship will continue through other courses and uh, through the other events that uh, the S program will uh, keep coming up with. Uh, today's session is uh, about consciousness. It's a vast subject, and uh, all the volumes have been written on it. Uh, nobody knows uh, too much about it. it. Remains a mysterious subject, but all the same, it's an interesting subject uh, for uh, the general public, for all of us, as well as uh, for scientists. Consciousness, uh, loosely speaking, means awareness. And uh, this awareness is about our surroundings, about what we know, about our capacity to do something and our deciding to do something. All this comes under the broad umbrella of being aware. And uh, all this is what consciousness is. But then uh, uh, our awareness as an individual is only a very small fraction of uh, everything that we can be aware of. It's only a small fraction of the total reality. So the reality as we perceive it is only a partial reality. And when reality is partial, it is also likely to be distorted. Because then, you know, we get, uh, it gets skewed in favor of uh, what we can perceive and what our personal bias is. And therefore, it is uh, both partial and distorted. And this is what we call is the mental consciousness. And in spiritual literature, we spell this type of a mental consciousness with a small c. In contrast with this is the mystic consciousness, uh, which is uh, aware of the total reality and therefore is much higher, wider and deeper. In a way, this entire journey from uh, the mental consciousness to the mystic consciousness is what the journey of yoga is about. It looks like a small change from a small C to a capital C. You know, that's how the mystic consciousness is spelled uh, with a capital C. Looks like a small change, but then uh, that is what the evolutionary thrust on the planet is about. Matter expressing only a very small fraction of this uh, total consciousness of the Supreme. And uh, those creatures which have a life expressing a little more and those which have a mind expressing still more and man being the latest product of that process, but uh, certainly not the final product. So the evolutionary thrust is about uh, expressing more of the supreme consciousness hidden even in dead matter. And uh, the mystic consciousness is uh, the awareness of the total reality. And between the two is a vast spectrum and somewhere on this spectrum, we all are. And the journey of yoga is about moving towards that larger consciousness and reaching that goal finally, hopefully one day in some life where the consciousness can be spelled with a capital C. So it looks like a small change from a small C to a capital C and yet what a long journey it is and what a profound difference it makes. Now, turning to the view of consciousness in uh, modern science, modern science considers uh, this consciousness, uh, whatever our awareness is at the mental level, to be an emergent property of the brain, which means it somehow emerges from the uh, activity of the brain. Uh, the activity of the brain means uh, the electrical activity in the nerve cells and the chemicals that they release, but for transmitting the messages from one nerve cell to the next. And uh, somehow these uh, minute electrical changes and the release of these small amounts of chemicals is what gives rise to consciousness. Somehow. And that somehow gets somehow camouflaged in different ways. But really speaking, science does not understand that. That remains an area of ignorance. But all the same, science continues to believe that uh, the awareness is an emergent property of the brain. On the other hand, from the spiritual point of view, we consider the brain also to be 
a part of the material frame which has been given to us for a purpose. And the purpose of the brain is to channelize a small fraction of the total consciousness. So it is only a channelizer, a utilizer, but not a generator of consciousness. Now you can argue uh, that, uh, well, if a person's uh, brain is dead, the person is not aware of anything. Even before the brain is completely dead, when the brain is knocked out, uh, the person goes into a coma. The person is not aware. The person is alive, but uh, cannot be aroused, is not aware of anything. And therefore, if uh, the brain is not functioning, the person is not aware. Therefore, awareness resides in the brain. But uh, then one can argue back that uh, the bulb, the electrical bulb, is uh, only channelizing the electricity. It is not uh, the generator of electricity. And it has been constructed in such a way that it will be able to convert this electrical energy into light. But all the same, it is only a generator. It's only a channelizer of the electrical energy. And uh, therefore, if we say that if there is no bulb, there will be no light, doesn't prove that uh, the bulb is the source of the light. The source of the light still is the electricity that flows through it. If the electricity doesn't flow, the bulb is of no use. So, uh, therefore, the another corollary from this is that if we want to understand electricity, we cannot understand it by dissecting the bulb. No amount of dissection of the bulb will reveal to us the secrets of electricity. For that, we have to turn somewhere else. In the same way, no amount of study of the brain, as modern science does, will actually be able to tell us the secrets of consciousness. The secrets of consciousness have been perceived by the rishis and the mystics across traditions uh, through another route, which is uh, beyond these senses. And uh, that is the way they have been able to uh, uh, perceive that uh, deeper, higher, and wider reality. Now, Therefore, you can argue both ways, but all the same, no amount of rational analysis can prove or disprove what the seat of consciousness is. And uh, we have the choice of either going on believing that one day the modern methods of science will be able to tell us how the minute electrical changes and the release of minute amounts of chemicals in the brain can translate into a subjective experience. One day we will understand it, or we can uh, believe the rishis and the mystics who have uh, been able to see it through another route by achieving what may be called a leap of consciousness. A leap of consciousness which enables them to see a, the possibility of a non-material entity uh, giving uh, way to a material process, a material structure. Now, this is what uh, the rishis and the mystics have perceived. And on a miniature scale, it is happening in our brain all the time. The uh, universal energy, which is uh, non-material in nature, is able to uh, make or express a small fraction of it through a material structure, which is in the brain. So this type of uh, a to and fro uh, sort of a connection the non-material uh, giving rise to the, the non-material channelizing through a material entity and the material processes or physical processes giving rise to a subjective experience. This type of a to and fro thing has happened uh, at the beginning of the universe when the non-material divine, uh, which uh, had not yet created matter, uh, expressed itself as matter. So there was that uh, link. And something similar is happening on a miniature scale in our mental consciousness too. So with this, uh, let's uh, turn to the PowerPoint. So this is our concluding session and we are concluding it consciously. The YES program is uh, a part of the celebrations of uh, the 150th birth anniversary of Shorobindo and uh, the 75th anniversary of India's independence.
I'll start with uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, with which many of the with whom with many of the previous sessions also started, and uh, you would have seen that he was a poet, and uh, many of the uh, lines that I shared at the beginning of some of the previous sessions were from one of his uh, long poems uh, in uh, the aristoc the uh, uh, the aristocrat or of the breakfast table. Now today we'll turn to one more poem of his. Uh, which is again a very interesting uh, poem based on uh, uh, probably an inspiration that he got someday about an idea. The idea that he got was that uh, if there could be a machine uh, in which uh, different parts were so good that they would not break down, but all the same, the machine having a limited life would one day stop functioning all at the same time. Then what would that machine be like? And uh, with this idea, he wrote this poem, The One Horseshoe. Now, this horseshoe are not standard words. Horse is horse, and she is chaise. So, chaise is a carriage which is pulled by a horse, generally has two wheels, and in which one or two people can sit. So, he is talking about a carriage, a horse a pulled carriage with the two wheels, and uh, uh, this sort of pronunciation, the horse would be how uh, the what the provincial accent would be like uh, in some parts of England, not uh, or the US, he was an American, not uh, the standard BBC or Voice of America accent, but all the same, uh, uh, this is what he meant, the one horse shape. And uh, this particular horse carriage about which this poem was built with excellent material so that it will last a hundred years. Each of the parts will have a lifespan of hundred years. With time, they'll keep wearing out and they'll stop functioning after hundred years. But since none of the parts will uh, uh, stop functioning somewhere midway, there'll be no breakdown. You know, we have seen that in automobiles, sometimes there's a breakdown and uh, it needs a change of some part. And uh, you change that part and the vehicle starts running again. So that's a breakdown. But this type of vehicle will not break down. So it will wear out, but will not break down. And after 100 years, each of the parts would have worn out to the extent that the machine will just stop functioning. So uh, the poem is very long. What I'll do is uh, only show you a few lines of it. And if you feel interested, in reading the whole of it and some other poems which are also there in this book, uh, the, the companion poems, How the Old Horse Won the Bet and the Broomstick Train. If you feel like uh, reading these, you can uh, always turn to this uh, URL on the slide on which this book is available for free download. So the one horse shay. Have you heard of the wonderful one horse shay? that was built in such a logical way, it ran a hundred years to a day, and then of a, of a sudden, it, ah, but stay. I'll tell you what happened without delay. So it ran perfectly for a hundred years, and then all of a sudden, what happened? The poet says, I'll tell you, just wait a while. And uh, what happened was, it scared the parson into fits. And the parson was the one who was, had, who was riding it, a church priest. And uh, he got scared when it happened, all of a sudden, frightening people out of their wits. Have you ever heard of that, I say? And uh, then it goes to the history, when this was to be built, how the best of material, the best of wood, the best of iron and everything was collected so that... Uh, there will be no breakdown. Each part will be perfectly crafted with the best possible material and it was designed to last a hundred years. So do I tell you, I rather guess she was a wonder and nothing less. So when it was finally built with that material, it was a wonderful thing to look at. And here it is, it's ready. The one horse shay, the one horse shays. And uh, Describe its uh, longevity, how long it went on working. It says, called screw horses, beards turned gray. So little horses, 
grew into adult horses. Young people who had beards, their beards turned gray. Deacon and deaconess dropped away. People died while the vehicle kept running. Children and grandchildren, where were they? So the children and the grandchildren, they grew up into adults. They were no longer children anymore. But there stood the stout old one horse she. But this carriage went on functioning as fresh as on Lisbon earthquake day. Little hall we value here wakes on the morn of its hundredth year without both feeling and looking queer. Beautiful sentence uh, about uh, the aging process. That little of all we value in this world wakes on the morn of its hundredth year. It's generally dead and gone by the hundredth year. And uh, before that happens, it uh, both feels and looks rather queer. In fact, there's nothing that keeps its youth so far as I know, but a tree and truth. So there are only two things that keep their youth. One is a tree and the other is truth. Again, beautiful selection of two words that keep their youth everlasting, even beyond the hundredth year. This is a moral that runs at large. Take it, you're welcome, no extra charge. And here is that beautiful one horse carriage running beautiful with the parson riding it. And then what happened one day, exactly a hundred years later? All at once the horse stood still because the carriage started trembling. All at once the horse stood, stood still, close by the meeting house on the hill, first a shiver and then a thrill, then something decidedly like a spill. You see, of course, if you're not a dunce, how it went to pieces all at once. All at once and nothing first, just as bubbles do when they burst. So here it is, the carriage all crumbled, the parson, poor parson, scared and in fits, scared out of his wits, landing on this, rambling on the floor and uh, left with only the horse and no carriage. End of the wonderful one horse shay. Logic is logic. That's all I say. So they were built very logically, as you said in the beginning, at each part to last a hundred years. So what type of machine do you think is the human body? Is it like the one horse shay or like the ordinary automobiles which keep having breakdowns? We are more like the ordinary automobile in the sense that uh, we all have a weak point. Uh, all our parts are not designed to last exactly the same duration. And that's why one person is more likely to get a peptic ulcer and another person more likely to get a heart disease and yet a third is more likely to get diabetes or a migraine. And uh, so we keep getting some breakdowns, uh, hiccups here and there because of the weak points in the body. And uh, what we would like actually is that we should have a machine more like the one horse shea, uh, or the one horse shays. Uh, we should have something like that so that uh, we keep functioning beautifully throughout life. And then at the end of it, uh, we don't mind if all the parts just stop functioning and we have a sudden painless death. Now we turn to today's subject, consciousness. There are two types of consciousness, small c and a capital C. Consciousness is awareness. When we spell it with a capital C, it is total awareness. And uh, these are the two poles of consciousness. This is the ordinary mental consciousness, which is based primarily on sensory experience and uh, sensory perception and past experience and memory, etc. We put all this together to construct a certain picture of reality. And at the other extreme is the mystic consciousness, which includes the mental consciousness. This person is also aware of uh, uh, whatever is around and uh, uses uh, the past experience and memory to construct a certain picture of a partial reality. But then within this, behind it and above it, he has a much wider, limitless 
awareness of a truth which has no boundaries, which is not confined to time and space. And that's why these dots, you know, uh, they keep getting uh, more and more uh, diffuse and sparse as you go, but there's no clear boundary where these uh, dots stop. And uh, so this indicates that infinite expansion uh, that this person exp uh, experiences. So the mystic experiences an, a, an enormous expansion of consciousness so that the consciousness uh, merges with the awareness which has no limits, which is not confined in time and space, and that he feels and finds and knows is uh, behind this manifestation, which is the form of the uh, mental consciousness. So what we perceive at the mental level is a manifestation, is another form of this higher, wider, and deeper consciousness. Now, do the scientists really understand consciousness? These uh, question marks indicate the black box, the area of ignorance. Uh, we see a flower for which we use the eyes. We have receptors which are sensitive to light here, the rods and cones, and we know in detail the pathway that uh, finally takes this to the part of the brain which uh, becomes active when uh, we look at a flower. The activity here increases and uh, we become aware of a flower. But then uh, all that is happening here is a set of uh, uh, physical chemical changes, electrical impulses, and release of certain chemicals, the neurotransmitters, and uh, the experience is subjective in nature. How these physical chemical changes translate into the experience of a pretty flower, we do not know. Now this then leads to a certain desire, a thought that I want this. Now this desire or this thought is also something subjective and this then translates into changes in another part of the brain. Now, science would have it that uh, I want it. This decision has also been taken by some part of the brain, which then transmits it to the area where action actually starts for making it possible to pluck the flower. But then uh, if you look at it, even in ordinary language, uh, we often say that uh, a thought came to me, an idea occurred to me, which means the thought came from outside. It came, um, came from somewhere and I became a channel for giving an expression to that thought. So we say a thought came to me. And spiritually speaking, actually that is very true because the thought comes to us from the universal consciousness and the brain is only a channelizer of it. It's an instrument. Uh, which has been constructed in such a way that it is able to channelize certain categories and a certain fraction of whatever is there in the universal consciousness. So uh, it channelizes it. But, and therefore we say a thought came to me. But then after a while we start saying, I think. So then, you know, we feel as if I generated the thought. So we start with a thought came to me and then we say, I think. So we appropriate the thought. An idea occurred to me, an idea came to me, and then we say my idea. So we appropriate that. And uh, since it was my idea, I also want an intellectual property right on it. <laughs> so uh, we are very quick at possessing and appropriating. So the person says, I want it. And then this uh, subjective decision, subjective desire is uh, correlated, associated, with a certain activity in a certain part of the brain from where nerve cells carry it to the spinal cord and there from there another nerve cell carries it to the muscles which need to contract to pluck the flower. Here's a quote from Sri Aurobindo which basically is trying to say that the uh, the Brain is not the generator of consciousness, but only a channelizer. Even for our ordinary thought and consciousness, these organs, that is the sensory organs, the nerves and the brain, are only there. This comes in a previous sentence, you know, so wow. that's why it has not been repeated in this sentence by him. Even for our ordinary thought and consciousness, these organs 
are only their habitual instruments and not their generators. They are the instruments habitually used for for channelizing the consciousness, channelizing a certain fraction of the consciousness. Now, there have been scientists who have engaged in these studies on consciousness, particularly during the last 100 years or so. And uh, in this category, uh, the first ones to uh, enter this field were the physicists and uh, then jumped onto the bandwagon of the neurophysiologists. And among the latest are the clinicians, the doctors who come in contact with patients. Mm -hmm. The physicists uh, entered it because uh, certain findings in modern physics, theoretical physics as it's sometimes called, or atomic physics, certain findings in that area were quite consistent with the spiritual worldview. Now, this is a level of physics that I do not understand. And without understanding much, I may just repeat, parrot fashion, that uh, if the spin of an electron changes in New Delhi, there can be a corresponding change in the spin of an electron in New York. So across distance, there can be an effect because of something happening here. So there's a cause and effect relationship between two events separated by a long distance and the transmission is uh, without any physical medium, does not require any physical medium, and the transmission is instantaneous, immediate, and it's unmitigated, that is, it does not reduce in intensity because of the distance. So this type of a transmission is possible. And uh, one way of explaining this is through a unified field of consciousness. That is the consciousness of the Supreme pervades everything and therefore different modes of consciousness can communicate. Now, for example, an individual here in New Delhi is a manifestation of the same Supreme Consciousness of which another individual in the United States is, and therefore uh, the two are separated, but all the same, this separation is illusory. Even the air gap that separates them is also a manifestation of the same Supreme Consciousness. So there is no real breach in continuity from one individual here, the air separating them and the other individual on the other side of the globe. So there's no real breach of continuity, no absolute breach of continuity. And uh, this is something which is, uh, in fact, what spirituality in a way is about. And the physicists found this uh, phenomenon of uh, the electron spin, uh, of uh, electrons getting uh, affecting the spin of another electron a long distance away. And uh, uh, this was found to be consistent with the spiritual worldview. And, uh, Therefore, uh, many physicists got interested in it and some physicists like Fritjof Capra, he was one of the pioneers, ended up writing books on it, popular paperbacks like the Tao of Physics. But this is something which I will not dwell on much because this is something which I don't fully understand and not uh, aware of it. But all the same, uh, these scientists were careful in emphasizing that uh, modern physics has not really proven or disproved the spiritual worldview, but has some findings which are consistent with the spiritual worldview. And uh, they also came up with alternative explanations which, are, which do not require the spiritual worldview. So with that caution and with that precision of language, let's try to understand that science, even physics, did not really end up proving the spiritual uh, worldview. And it and in fact, no scientific studies have been able to do it because the methods of science are not only inadequate, but also inappropriate for understanding uh, the link between the material and the non-material. I'll turn instead to the next category of scientists, the neurophysiologists, and uh, concentrate on a few neurophysiological studies. And let me start with the uh, uh, paying my regards to these three gentlemen, 
all three of my teachers at the Department of Physiology in the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. Dr. B.K. Anand, the founder head of the Department of Physiology at Ames, uh, and uh, who continued to be the Professor Emeritus uh, till he left this world. Dr. Baldev Singh, who st started his career at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences at the age of 60 plus because there was no other neurologist available at that time in the country. And uh, that's how as a special case, he was appointed as the founder head of the Department of Neurology. And then after retirement, he joined the Department of Physiology as an emeritus professor and continued to be there almost till the end. He had to leave a little before uh, he left the world because of failing eyesight. Uh, 1904 born and uh, went on working at the institute uh, till uh, about 1992, that's uh, 88, and left this world in, uh, in 1998 at the age of 94. Professor Gulzar Singh Sheena, uh, another scientist who went on to become the head of the Department of Physiology and uh, retired in 1986 and continued to work in the United States at the Ohio State University in Columbus, even post-retirement, till he was almost 90. Now, these three scientists, they did some pioneering studies on yogis, advanced yogis, and it's very difficult to get them because most yogis are not interested in this type of studies. They don't want to volunteer. And as Professor China used to say that many of those yogis said that you scientists are glorified fools. Because the, the yogi feels, you know, that uh, this is something which is beyond scientific research. And uh, just by looking at uh, hooking us to some instruments and finding a little change here and a little change there, they think that they have studied us and they have studied our consciousness. The scientists can't do that because all they have done is found some correlates, something associated. And associations do not prove cause and effect relationship. Just because you find some changes in the brain happening at the same time as which at which the yogi is having a certain experience, it does not mean that that electrical change which you have measured, observed is actually uh, responsible for, is the cause and uh, the uh, change in consciousness, the state of consciousness is the effect. You cannot uh, have a cause and effect relationship. You cannot deduce a cause and effect relationship from a mere association. And uh, what is really happening in the yogi is within. It is more of inner work and inner change. And that is something which cannot be measured. Inner work is not visible. And so is inner change not quantifiable. You cannot say that the person's consciousness has now gone up by one kilo or by one kilometer. You can't measure it that way. And therefore, uh, the yogis, uh, he said, you consider us glorified fools. And one yogi actually told them that. Uh, but all the same, they did study, um, do, did some pioneering studies, which are still quoted in the 1960s. And I'll show you one of those, which is relevant to the field of consciousness on yogis when they were not meditating and when they were meditating and were therefore going through some peak uh, sort of level of consciousness, some peak experience, or at least they were in a uh, state of consciousness uh, which was far above the ordinary mental consciousness. Now, these are the electroencephalographic electroencephalograms, the EEGs, before meditation and during meditation. Now, before meditation, when the person is relaxed and inattentive, mentally not very active, the EEG shows this alpha rhythm which has uh, these waves, which are rather big in amplitude and low in frequency. But if you distract the person, uh, you invite the person's attention, the, make the person pay attention by say, uh, a bang, a clap, some sound, or a vibration, say by applying a tuning fork on somewhere on the body, you know, tuning fork vibrates, a metallic thing which vibrates. So you expose the person to a vibration, or you uh, have a, a tube, a test tube, glass test tube, having some hot water in it, and you touch it somewhere on the body, 
So by any of these sensory stimuli, you find that this alpha rhythm is blocked. It gets replaced by the beta rhythm, which has a low amplitude. The waves are small, but they're more frequent uh, by high frequency, low amplitude, EEG. So this is what happens to ordinary people. This is what happened to these yogis also before meditation. But when they were meditating, something interesting happened. And, uh, and the bang or the vibration or the hot tube could not disturb the alpha rhythm, could not block the alpha rhythm. It did not get replaced by the beta rhythm. It continued. Which means that uh, the yogis were in a state of consciousness in which none of these things could distract them. It could not they could not be bothered less. So they could remain completely immune to the effects of these sensory stimuli. So this was an altered state of consciousness. Now, one might say that uh, uh, they had worked on their consciousness in such a way and during meditation they were in a state of consciousness in which they could not be disturbed by these sensory stimuli. So these yogic practices were the cause and this altered consciousness was the effect. But then people also argued the other way, it is quite peace possible that people who have this type of a tendency not to get distracted are the ones who are attracted to yoga. So this was something inherent and it is not the effect of the yogic practices. So you can look at it either way. So you can see the type of uh, logic into which science and our rationality tends to go. So really you cannot uh, prove a cause and effect relationship even through this association between uh, the yogis and this phenomenon. Whether it is the yogic practices leading to this effect or it is this type of a tendency which was inbuilt in them they were different from other ordinary people. They were constructed differently. They were made differently, which made them turn to yoga. And maybe many others may be having this ability, but have not turned to yoga and we have not studied them, which is something which can emerge only through large-scale controlled studies. And therefore, in science, you can really never prove or disprove anything. Everything remains a subject of doubt and discussion. There have been other studies uh, following that on the same lines and different. Uh, one of the studies that made headlines was uh, brain imaging studies. That is studies which uh, uh, reveal what is happening in which part of the brain. Now, this is these are studies which go beyond the ordinary EEG. These are studies which are done through the uh, study of blood flow through the brain, like say PET studies and so on. So these are studies which go, which are actually imaging the brain, studying which part of the brain is uh, active and which part is inactive during a certain state of consciousness. So they did these brain imaging studies on uh, some nuns while they were praying and on meditating Buddhists. And they told them that when you go through a certain peak experience, just give us a little indication so that we would know. So, you know, they could correlate the change in their uh, brain images, that is, which part of the brain is active or inactive uh, with the type of experience that uh, these nuns or these Buddhist monks were having. And uh, on the basis of their findings, they finally end up, ended up coming with a book with the tantalizing title, Why God Won't Go Away. What they found was that during peak spiritual experience, the activity in areas of the brain concerned with attention to sensory stimuli decreased. That is the areas which normally become active when we are paying uh, attention to sensory stimuli, the activity in those parts of the brain decreased. So, you know, this corresponds with those EEG studies. Uh, the brain, parts of the brain which are active when uh, uh, we pay attention to sensory stimuli, they were less active. And this corresponds with the yogi not getting disturbed by these sensory stimuli. On the other hand, some other parts of the brain became more active. So it appears as if uh, those parts which uh, can give us those type of peak experiences normally remain suppressed because of all types of sensory stimuli. But when the yogi or the monk or the nun uh, goes into a meditative state, then 
uh, the areas of the brain which pay attention to sensory stimuli or uh, which are which have increased activity during sensory attention to sensory stimuli their activity goes down and when that activity goes down as if by default some other parts of the brain which are correlated with that peak spiritual experience they become more active so the brain is wired in such a way that if this part is active the part which is uh, engaged in activity when we are paying attention to sensory stimuli when that is active the other part remains suppressed if we reduce this then by default the other part becomes more active and we uh, that is correlated with that peak spiritual experience now these findings the interpretation of the scientists was that uh, since the perception of a supra physical reality by the meditating nun or monk correlates with a change in the pattern of activity in the brain and the activity in a certain part of the brain increases it's quite possible that uh, that is the part that uh, is responsible for or is channelizing the perception of that, that higher reality so it's consistent with the spiritual uh, world view it is also consistent with the existence of a supra physical reality so it is consistent with it consistent with it does not mean that it has proven the existence of god or that supra physical reality it is consistent with it because there is a certain change in the pattern of the brain activity during that experience so there's a correlate now there's an association the association does not prove a cause and effect relationship the association does not prove the existence of god so their interpretation was pretty cautious but some spiritual enthusiasts jumped at it and said that see now science has proven the existence of god science can not prove it and the science cannot disprove it these findings were only consistent with that the existence of that supra physical reality now how about the clinical studies these clinical studies uh, have been of many types uh, using yogic practices for treatment of heart disease etc but those are not the ones which are really so relevant to consciousness what is more relevant to consciousness are the studies on prayer the effects of prayer on healing because that is what is happening is that uh, the healing intentions noble intentions good intentions of one individual are having an effect on another individual so one person's mind is affecting another person's body the well wisher's mind while praying is able to affect the patient's body who is which is sick now when these study these studies have shown mildly positive results and uh, one person who has done a lot of uh, uh, service to this area is larry dossi uh, a physician trained in modern scientific medicine but then uh, who has uh, put together a lot of work in this area in a large number of paperbacks and one of them is shown here reinventing medicine uh, so these effects of prayer are generally speaking positive although weak but then the scientific argument against these studies has been that uh, there is in fact a mind body relationship that is the person's mind can affect his own body and when the person knows that i am being prayed for by somebody then the person feels that i will get better and because the person thinks that i will get get better he actually gets better so it is the patient's mind uh, healing the patient's body the prayer has nothing to do with it and in this area this is an argument which is very difficult to counteract and uh, therefore what has been more helpful are animal studies and uh, one of the well known animal studies is on rats in which uh, an incision was given and it was found that the incision healed much faster if uh, somebody a uh, healer held that cage in the hands for 15 minutes a day and prayed for the quick healing of the wound uh, but when i say that the uh, rats which had the incision were also enjoying this extra attention and so it was the rats mind influencing the rats body then there have been plant studies can the growth of a plant be similarly stimulated uh, those who are fond of gardening do find that if they love their plants if they pay uh, 
loving attention to the plants, the plant grows much faster and better. But then that may also be questioned. Uh, of course, it is uh, one feels that uh, plants don't have the type of mind that human beings or rats and mice have. But all the same, if we go further down the evolutionary scale, the studies become more convincing in terms of proving that there is a unified field of consciousness, that there is a continuous uh, consciousness, a continuity in consciousness between the uh, continuity in consciousness between the person who is praying and the object of prayer, even if it is a plant. There have been studies on uh, uh, the willing, wishing, intending or praying for increasing or decreasing the rate of multiplication of germs. And it has been found that, uh, again, the effects are positive. Now, the germs probably could not be enjoying that extra attention or thinking that somebody is praying for me to grow faster or slower and therefore uh, affecting the germs body. This type of a thought. So, more convincing. But then, still more convincing are studies on cell cultures where we don't have a germ, but just some cells which are being grown in a medium in which they get all the food, etc., and so the cells can multiply. And the multiplication of these cells can be in the rate of multiplication of these cells can be increased or decreased by similar uh, prayer or, as it's called more often in scientific studies, wishing, willing, or intending. Uh, so cell cultures, for example, cultures of cells taken from a cancerous tissue can increase or decrease their rate of multiplication in response to this type of an intention, a healing intention. So can this have an effect on a person who has cancer? Uh, if it can happen outside the body, can it also happen inside the body? Not becomes a little more convincing than maybe even it can happen also within the body. Still more convincing are enzyme activity studies. Here you have an enzyme that is something which can bring about a chemical reaction and those substances on which it can act to bring about the chemical reaction, that's called the substrate. So you have the enzyme and the substrate uh, in the same tube, oh, sorry, in the enzyme and the substrate in a tube and then somebody wishes, wills or intends that the rate of this chemical reaction should increase or decrease, and whatever is wished in this way seems to have some effect. So if even chemicals, non-living substances in a test tube can be affected in their behavior by this type of uh, what is going on in the mind of a human being at a distance, one can sort of see that there is a good uh, evidence for continuous Continuity of consciousness. How to sort of show it in a simple way, how it translates into the effect of prayer or wishing, willing, and intending by one person, be it a healer, be it a doctor, or an ordinary person on a person's body who is sick. So A is the healer and B is the patient. And uh, one can say that the mind of A is a subtle manifestation of the universal consciousness or the supreme consciousness of the divine. And uh, the body of B is also a gross manifestation of the same, a gross manifestation of the divine. So A's mind is a subtle manifestation, B's body is a gross manifestation, but they are manifestations of the same supreme consciousness of the same divine. And the air that is separating them, that also is all pervaded by the same. And therefore, since uh, they are all uh, this uh, the spirit of the divine is all pervasive there is no real breach, breach of continuity a and b happen to be solid condensations of the same consciousness so therefore this subtle manifestation of consciousness in a that is the mind whatever goes on there can influence through this consciousness which is not an ordinary physical medium the body of b which is a gross manifestation of the same so that's how this person's mind, the healer's mind, can affect the patient's body. Now turning again to whether through all these studies we have a scientific proof, be they uh, the findings in theoretical physics, be, be they the neurophysiological studies or these clinical studies, 
are they a scientific proof for the spiritual worldview are a scientific proof of the supreme consciousness of the divine and uh, the manifestation of that uh, refraction of that in the manifestation are they a proof of that the data is consistent data of these studies is consistent with the world view based on the spiritual consciousness that is true but being consistent does not or having a correlation having an association does not prove a cause and effect relationship science has therefore been neither able to prove nor disprove the existence of god or the supreme consciousness so if there is no real proof uh what can be the attitude of scientists one attitude can be that this altered consciousness which the rishis and the mystics have reported in the past in the scriptures etc like the upanishads and which these experiment those experimented upon nuns and monks and yogis have shown this altered state of consciousness does not really exist it is only their hallucination they are reporting something which actually does not exist there nothing like the divine nothing like this all pervasive spirit of the divine it's all their hallucination the other attitude can be and this is to the attitude of hardcore scientists and uh, uh, therefore they in general are not interested in this type of studies and if they study their main aim seems to be to prove that the rishi or the mystic is wrong the second possibility is that the altered consciousness does not perceive the truth yes there is an altered state of consciousness uh, which uh, the yogi or the rishi or the mystic or the nun or the monk has but what they are reporting during that phase the awareness of the divine or the awareness of the all pervasive spirit of the divine that is not really the truth something exists but it is not a part of the truth so the altered state of consciousness is not purely a hallucination but all the same they are not perceiving something that is true or something which is possible and the third is an open minded approach that this altered consciousness may perceive the truth so although the hardcore scientists have tend to have this attitude in fact you find that uh, this attitude is the one which is more scientific because one of the attributes is, of science is to remain open and to always believe that the limits of our knowledge are not the limits of truth that is a basic dictum in the scientific philosophy and uh, it's only this uh, success of the scientific enterprise that has so hypnotized us and sometimes in infused science and scientists with such arrogance that they tend to have a very unscientific attitude and they reject even the possibility of something existing which uh, uh, science has not been able to study or science will not be able to study and that is why ravi ravindra who is himself a scientist a spiritually oriented scientist said that during the european renaissance uh, rationality had to be uh, rescued from the clutches of the church but now it seems the time has come when a spiritual wisdom will have to be rescued from the clutches of science from the clutches of orthodox science so science itself has become orthodox in certain beliefs that if we don't know it or if we will not be able to know it if it is beyond our purview then it does not exist you know it's something like this if you have an object which is lost but the lamp is somewhere else one approach is that if i because i don't see it under the lamp the object doesn't exist the object is there in the dark but all the same the one who is only concentrating on what is visible under that lamp concludes that the object doesn't exist because i can't see it so that is the approach of orthodox science whereas uh, the other approach is that perhaps the object exists but since i have only a lamp let me start looking for the object under the lamp where the light is so he told that the object is there but it is not under the lamp but he says but this is the only place i can search properly so that is the approach of scientists who go on studying consciousness with the tools that they have and uh, the third is the possibility that well i may study what is there under the lamp but all the same it's quite possible that uh, the object that i am looking for is not under the lamp but somewhere in the dark 
and I don't have the tools, I don't have that light, uh, that bulb, which can illumine that dark area. So that is the open-minded scientific approach. Until we are able to discover that light, I'll go on conceding the possibility that maybe it exists. And if that does not exist, if somebody has that type of a lamp, an inner lamp, maybe if I use the same methods which that person has used, I'll also be able to see it. So that is the true scientific spirit. So it means that if uh, I have to have the same experience as the Rishi or the mystic, and I find that my methods as a scientist are inadequate and inappropriate for it, I should be willing to use the same methods. For example, if uh, a scientist tells us that there are thousands of cells in a leaf, and I say that, well, I don't see those cells, all what I see is a green sheet of paper, something like a green sheet of paper, then the scientist will tell me that, well, I used a microscope to see the cells. So unless I'm willing to use the microscope, I'll not be able to see those cells. In the same way, the Rishi or the mystic tells me that I have experienced it. And for that, I used the methods of intense concentration and extreme degrees of self-purification. So unless I, as a scientist, am also willing to use the same methods, I cannot say that the experience of the Rishi is a hallucination. That experience is impossible. Either I should use the same methods or just believe the Rishi or the mystic that maybe with, by using those methods, this reality can be perceived. The next question that arises is, is scientific verification really necessary? It is not really necessary because science has a limited purview and within that it has been very successful. But that is the realm of the physical world and the physical world as it can be observed through senses, unaided or aided by instruments. And within that, it has been able to discover a large amount of uh, facts, a large fraction of the truth, a certain fraction of the truth, which uh, is quite enough to give us the tools of even landing on the moon. That is true. But then it is only part of the truth. A part of the truth for which it has given us great depth and detail. But then the part, whereas the spiritual truth uh, is the total truth and the fraction need not certify or verify the total truth. That's beyond it. And therefore, scientific verification is not really necessary. And yet these days it sometimes appears that verification by science is a necessary, is a necessity. Why it seems necessary is because uh, science has been a successful enterprise, it has revolutionized our, revolutionized our lives, and therefore, one has, one has started believing that uh, uh, being scientific is synonymous with being true. And therefore, if it is not scientific, it is not true. And that is why this sometimes seems necessary, although it is not. Now here the spiritual enthusiasts also sometimes uh, make a mistake in their enthusiasm and their emotional attachment to the spiritual wisdom. And they take two contrasting contradictory stands. One is spirituality discovered all of science long ago. So if there's a study which shows something unique about uh, the yogis or the rishis or the mystics or the nuns and the monks, studies of that type, they say, well, science has discovered these spiritual truths only now, or they've started conceding them only now. Spirituality, rishis and mystics discovered it thousands of years ago. So, in other words, uh, at least we have the precedence. Why precedence by itself actually does not really uh, have a good, solid, rational claim to superiority, because if something has been discovered by another alternative means, even if it is later, but uh, it is original in its own discovery, then the precedence does not matter. If two people without knowing what the other discovered, discover some, the same thing a few thousand years apart, precedence by itself does not constitute superiority. But all the same, that is the type of stand that is taken. And on the other hand, the same spiritual enthusiasts take the stand, well, see, look, now science has proven the spiritual truths. Now, if... Spirituality is superior to science. 
It discovered it long ago. It discovered the total truth, whereas science is discovering only part of the truth. Then why does this wisdom require certification by science? I'll end this with uh, a little poem. Uh, I'm not a poet, but sometimes I get uh, some rhyming expressions. I get them. They come to me from outside. And I give expression to them. And uh, they may be just rhymes, but all the same, I call them poems. And since this course has been about uh, the human body, which one may consider to be a machine, I'll go through this poem with you. <clears throat> Using a gadget is great, but making the machine is greater still. So we only use our machine, the human machine. The machine is made in the mother's womb. So that is something much greater than using it. Inventing the instrument, however, needs the greatest skill. And who invented this instrument? The divine. Using a gadget is great, but making the machine is greater still. Inventing the instrument, however, needs the greatest skill. Life is a machine invented by the divine. Into matter, he injects life to make it a tool divine. The role of we mortals is the simplest of all. To use the machine to fulfill his plans, big and small. So basically, we arrive as instruments. Our tasks are given to us when we are born. How we will fulfill his plans so that our soul can evolve and continue its onward journey from life to life. Though his bidding is easier said than done. So although the mission is given to us at birth, to do what uh, we need to do is easier said than done because the road to his plans is blocked by bullies more than one. The first bully is ego, a bloated balloon. Puncture it as you may, it fills itself soon. The second bully is desire, a multiplying tribe, oust one and find two, begging for a bribe. Despair not, for there are friends. These friends, no, they can facilitate the journey to his ends. The first friend is surrender. Silence your mind and you will hear his voice clear and kind. Reason no more, do what he says. Conflict only clouds the vision. He takes, you anyway end up where he takes. The second friend is merger. There is after all the same divine spark in beings big and small. So that merger comes through love. Love induces intimacy, feel like giving. Uh, and that love in turn is based on a sense of oneness. The second friend is merger. There is after all the same divine spark in beings big and small. If you are in pain, I should weep as well. Your moments of joy should make my heart swell. Merger is easy to preach but difficult to practice that my needs come first is very easy to establish. To fit into his plans, there are thus dictums for no ego, no desire. So keep these bullies away, keep them under control. And uh, if the ego is under control, the desires are very easy to control because much of our desires are meant to boost our ego. So the desires lose their intensity when they lose that support. No ego, no desire. And then the positive tools are total surrender, merge more, merge more with the rest of the creation. Now what has science done? It has added depth and detail to spiritual wisdom. But all the same, it cannot prove or disprove it. It keeps scratching the surface. Science reveals to us how minute is the care, how cunning the device how intense the absorption it bestows upon the smallest of its works, even as on the largest. So I've seen during the last few weeks uh, what uh, a wonderful machine the human machine is and uh, how much care has gone into it. And the care that the divine has bestowed does not depend upon the size or the importance that we human beings ascribe to a creation to one of the works of the divine. 
the divine has, has bestowed the same amount of care. And as we saw, the basic processes of life, which are so uniquely designed, are essentially the same in a single-celled animal as in the human being. So even that single-celled animal, the amoeba, but for that matter, even a lump of clay, it has received the same amount of care as uh, the largest and what we consider to be the best creation so far, the human being. Why I said even a lump of clay is because uh, there's a little a sort of a concocted story uh, which uh, is which brings about which talks about the clay. Once you know a group of scientists, they finally, starting with a lump of clay, could create life. And they said, "See, uh, we have been able to do what God has done. We have also been able to create life from something non-living, just a lump of clay. So we have created life. And then God heard it and told them, "Just hold on, son. Uh, first, bring your own clay." So who created the clay? When the scientist says that uh, the brain is so wired as to give us to this type of an experience, who wired that brain? Who was that master electrician? That is the question that sometimes we forget to ask in our human arrogance. But the divine does not care. The care that it bestows is on crafting us, is on the care that he shows is in uh, helping us continue the onward journey the onward journey of the soul and uh, if we are able to do that we not only find that the journey moves on we also find that life becomes much more pleasant it becomes filled with love peace and joy and a sense of fulfillment science reveals to us how minute is the care how cunning the device how intense the absorption it bestows upon the smallest of its works, even as on the largest. I'm not calling it uh, thank you or the end, because that gives an impression as if uh, we are signing off. Uh, because uh, as I said in the beginning, our relationship would continue. and. Uh, this was just sort of a summing up today of some of the related things which bridge science and spirituality. And consciousness is probably one of those subjects which can do it the best. So that's why I ended up talking a bit about it. So with this now, I hand over to Aditi for uh, continuing further. Yes, and then I will hand it over to the participants for continuing further with asking questions. And so anybody who has any question, they can either write it or share it. And also since we will have, as Sir said, interview, if you have any feedback or anything you want to share, you can briefly share that as well. So yes, please go ahead. First, thank you so much for such a uh, blissful experience of your, attending your session. You all are very, very blessed. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you so much. The other thing uh, I want to clear, uh, why is there is so much of uh, scatteredness in the thought and uh, so much of uh, cloudiness in, in thoughts? And uh, the, in the same flow, I want to ask why uh, visualization is so poor in some persons? Lack of clarity, uh, vacillation, these are characteristics of the intellect because we are so constituted and these are characteristics in a way of partial knowledge. It's only when uh, the intellect gets anchored to that which has the total knowledge and which we have within us, our divine essence is the soul. So it's only when the intellect is anchored to the, inter in when the, intellect is anchored to the soul that uh, these things will tend to reduce and finally disappear one day. Thank you so much. And you're already clear in this uh, session very much when we um, about the consciousness. Thank you so much. It means a lot to me. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Vijlani, Aditi, and to the entire YES team. It's been, um, 
it's been a beautiful way to start the mornings and uh, heartful thanks for that for all your effort and the consistency that goes into it i have a query or more a comment is there a way in which we can reflect or introspect and know if we are growing in our consciousness or regressing are there ways in which we can keep that radar on you know saying that uh, strictly speaking there is no way one can measure these things uh, you can't say that the consciousness has grown by 1 kilo or 1 kilometer uh, but all the same uh, that type of efforts have been made uh, david hawkins has tried to uh, quantify consciousness uh, by measuring you know the way the muscle tone increases or decreases you know anything genuine uh, leads to a relaxation of effort and the relaxation of the muscles and so on so from that one can make out and also uh, it's relaxed but at the same time gives us an inner strength so that strength also gets reflected in those kinesiological studies whereas uh, when uh, anything not genuine or any falsehood anything fake uh, makes us feel drained and uh, weak and that also shows in these kinesiological studies so through that he has tried to quantify but on a more ordinary level uh, some of the tests which uh, one of the most important indicators of this is equanimity being able to stay at peace uh, in all circumstances that is one of the indicators and uh, for that we always would feel in that uh, maybe there is still more scope and have i really made any progress but then if we really make an effort one can reflect back and say that maybe uh, if i were in the similar circumstances in in 10 years ago would i have uh, reacted in the same way would i have uh, been as uh, cool and composed as i am today if the answer is no 10 years ago i would have been much more uh, uh, upset by the same thing then it so we have made some progress or in the same way while making choices uh, choices at the level of the mind or the choices at the level of the soul now uh, if uh, today i make a level of choice at the level of the soul and i reflect back and i feel that maybe 10 years ago in a similar situation i would have made a choice at the level of the emotions or the intellect rather than at the level of the soul so i feel that yes i have made some progress so there are some ways in which best by reflection one can have some idea of the progress but the most important thing is not to worry too much about the progress uh leave the progress to the divine yeah we keep doing what we have to do or as they say uh, keep your eye on the ball not on the scoreboard thank you so much that's very heartening to know thank you dr vishnan thank you aditi aditi have i missed anything or you would like to add anything to continue no i think we have covered all the points and it's a good time to end with a moment of silence and a collective gratitude offering thank you everyone Thank you everyone and thank you to the mother and shri aurobindo for making it all possible thank you